Nature has been being designed for around about 3.8 billion years. And in the rest of the world, we're kind of amateurs in what we're, in what we're doing. And part of my question, my inquiry for this talk is to say, so why is that, why is that important? And I would put to you that, that the problem is that design was never designed for living. There's a joke about a conversation about food and people say, why is it that we say that the French live to eat? And they say, but why is it that the British eat to die? <laughs> and, and the same about design, is that good design would be about a different kind of function. And I want you to take back to a childhood story from Snow White and the Huntsman, where Snow White is in a situation where the, the evil queen is asking ma magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror always gives the answer that the queen wants to hear, until Snow White comes along. And there's a lovely story, as you know, that develops on the back of that. But the problem that we have in relation to that is that, actually, the mirror isn't giving us an accurate story of what's going on. Because the consequence of our design of products, systems, ways of working, has got, an, has got a consequence on the environment of $6.6 .6 trillion a year of unpaid debt. That's the consequence of designing things that are not fit for nature. That's the pollution of our streams, our rivers, the CO2, the damage, the human cost, is currently free to business. Which is amazing. That's 11% of GDP. So the challenge we've got is that if we pay the money, the business will go out of business. And if you don't pay it, you go out of business. And not only is that a lot of money, but that's going to be increasing, as you can see, to around about $28 trillion a year of cost by 2050 on the current trajectory. And where that's found, where that's seen, this is on my local beach. At the minute, you can buy a cheap surfboard. It's so cheap and badly made, you throw it away at the end of the day. It doesn't stay in landfill for 10 minutes. It stays in landfill for maybe 10,000 years and will never actually degrade. That's free. This is, one of, this is a picture taken on one of the most remote beaches in the UK, on the Outer Hebrides, this summer. All the debris on the beach from fish farms, your smoked salmon. Isn't in the price of the smoked salmon you buy from Waitrose. But it stays in the environment for tens of thousands of years. Now the lovely thing is you can create a fantastic children's activities. You can do beach cleans. We have this lovely phrase about these things, plastic granules, they're called mermaid tears. But that's not actually the space that I'd like these children to grow up in. So when you think about design, everything that we celebrate has got a consequence that we can't see. And we talked, you know, we, we, when we're thinking about the work we did, I one of my jobs in early in my career was working in a gold mine and seeing the piles of cyanide, the pools, the football field you know, cyanide pools, so people can make jewellery or put it back in the ground. That's the cost that we don't see. And even the most sophisticated calculators that you can buy in the world of accountancy don't have a button on it for bad design. You can do tax, you can do VAT, you can do margin, you can calculate big numbers, but you can't say what's the cost of doing bad design. And the challenge you've got is that the bad design is picked up right now as an IOU. And the IOU is coming to bite us in the ass, which we're starting to see in terms of impact on climate, impact on health, impact on well-being. When we talk, when we talk in the world of public health and ask people, you know, how's the health service going to do? Whatever country we're in, it's not a question if the wheels will come off, but when about our sedentary lifestyle, about our lack of activity, about the diet we eat. All of that's an IOU that we cannot keep putting off forever. And so I think there's a different approach that we can take that's about designing, designing for living by taking nature as our teacher and creating a different set of rules around design that are based on what actually works rather than just what looks sexy. Because for us to stick around 
for a bit longer than perhaps we were currently planned to be, let's start to, to work this out. And there's a little, lovely little joke about this for people who don't kind of get why this is important. And I, st I stole this from Michael Braungart. I'm sure he stole it from someone else. Saying two planets are in space one day, having a conversation. One says, how are you feeling? Not very good. Sweating a bit, hot. What is it? Oh, I've, got, uh, I've got Homo sapiens. <laughs> <sighs> oh, shit. And the other planet says, it's okay. I'll hide it once. And you know, this is what we have to deal with. So, what, so I think the opportunity we've got is to think in a really different way and engage with nature and find nature as a teacher for ourselves. And when we spend time in nature and look at what works, we can find a completely different, more elegant set of rules about design that have been proven that work over time. And when I look around the world that I, that I travel in, and this is up in the Hebrides on a piece of moorland, in my garden pond, this amazing moth on my, on my window this summer. Look at the kind of design, the quality of build. We can't, we can't, you know, our design isn't close to this yet. We can 3D print fish, maybe. We can't 3D print this. And when you take time in nature to look at what beauty looks like for real and say, what are the principles that have allowed these amazing things around us to live in that way? We get a different perspective. We get to see that when we look at the seashell, the closest thing that we have in our world to a seashell is like porcelain, like a cup. The seashell builds itself at ambient temperature out of resources that are in the sea. And at end of life, dissolves back into seawater. You know, with, with nanotechnology, we're getting close to some of this, but there's a really, really better way of finding this. Looking at the way that when nature goes through its seasons and its cycles, that the chlorophyll is taken out of the plants before they die, because it's a valuable resource. So that we end up composting the things that need to be there. To think about the way that nature communicates. When you look at seeds in nature, you really get to understand the process of communication in a different way. Thinking about how nature blows seeds around, it shares seeds, people eat them, they get caught on things. We're really crude about the way that we take that forwards. The bramble, the humble bramble, the blackberry, is a traction system where the barbs, as it pushes through the undergrowth, stop it being pulled accidentally back by the wind or the passage of animals to allow it to move forward so its, its structures allow it to grow further and grow faster. The way that the, the rose hip is food. The message is the seed, but the message is wrapped up in something that's so tasty that other animals come along and eat it, and in doing so they take the message and drop them elsewhere in a little pile of fertiliser, ready to grow in somewhere else in my garden or beyond. And that the, the, the undergrowth provides the homes for the things that make the system work in itself. The badger runs and the, and the rabbit runs are in a different space. And how we can use nature as an indicator for health. You don't see lichen on trees when the air is polluted. It's a monitor for doing things in a different way. So when you start to observe we can find things that work. And the irony of these two materials here, ceramics on an old piece of, on an old piece of sculpture we had, versus the bones. M many people who live in the countryside, it's unsettling for city folks. Their homes look like ossuaries. Our home is full of bones from different animals, but other people find it quite macabre. But you understand what the materials are about. And that if you take that simplicity and you put it into some of the things that we make, you get things like these wonderful axes from Gransfors, which are only made out of wood and steel. There's no varnish, there's no epoxy resin, there's nothing that couldn't rot back into the ground at end of use. And they happen to be designed as the best things that we've ever got. And we need to do this because the, the science and the physics of what we've got to do is radical in terms of the shift. We ha we're using more resources than we have space for on the planet. If we don't get that, that's like the idea of six people sitting around a table gambling and you can only gamble with the resources you've got. You can't gamble with more. Of the carbon that's in our air, two-thirds of what's been discovered needs to stay in the 
in the ground. That means that the pension value and so on that you've got invested in that can't work. And we need to think in a radically new way about what's possible, shifting away from incremental change to new structures, new ways of doing things. Stepping away from these machine-like structures to a different way of doing things. So what I'm going to talk you through is this idea that we can move away from the idea of maximising to optimising. You can't keep growing forever. There isn't enough space. Nature optimises. It doesn't try to grow the biggest tree in the forest. Because that would be wasteful. It, so, so thinking about a different way of valuing success and measuring what we're doing. Thinking about the idea of building, building resilience rather than strength. Resilience is the ability of a species or a thing or a person to, to step back up after it's been knocked down. How do we build resilience in a different way? How do we step into a world of being adaptive, of, of designing for redundancy? How do we bring improvisation, as nature does, into the everyday part of what we do? These are different works that create different outcomes. They're far more flexible, less predictable, less measurable. How do you create a performance management system in a business when you don't know what the outcomes are going to be? Yet we've all stuck in spaces where the programs dictate what people do on a different basis. One of the qualities of life in itself is that it creates conditions conducive for life. That's how nature works. That's how it's been around for so long. Nature couldn't have existed for so long if it didn't make everything as food for something else. And the move now in industrial systems towards cradle to cradle and circular economy is starting to mimic the idea that in nature, everything is food for something else. And in doing so, we can make it life supportive, as opposed to being destroying life because the fabrics and materials we use kill nature. The only point to get to is where we stop doing that, rather than kill nature more slowly. The end of fishing on current rates of extraction is 2043 or thereabouts. That'll be the date when the last fishing boat in the world operates. The last commercial fishing boat at current rates of extraction. It's crazy. What would it look like if we started to, wait to use things in that way? How do, we th how do we develop ways of working in proper systems around health and well-being? So how do we properly join up business and government, design and delivery, in a way that steps people away from the silos that stop cooperation? That means if you improve conditions at work that you can get some of the benefits by in that world? How do we get beyond the crazy sort of silo thinking? How do we create a values-based way of working based on what's really important? The money's not what's important. That doesn't m people talk about being mon motivated by money. It doesn't motivate people. It doesn't work. To make this happen, I believe, what we've got to do is to step into a different space. And that means stealing the very best ideas from business. Business is good at delivering. It just does the wrong stuff. But it's awesome at getting things out the door quickly. We need to work with local government to underpin the bottom left-hand side of this frame, the legislation and regulations. We need, to, we need to use the networks of people involved with communities to do the work on the ground that connects us. But recognise that those people by themselves haven't often got the skills to do the delivery, the marketing, the communications that takes these things forwards. And to step into this top right box, which is where radical change can happen. It's asking, if you couldn't fail, what would you do? If you couldn't fail, how many elected members where you live would know the basics of what's going to shape the future of your community around floods and food and health and well-being? And if we start from the end point, you end up in a very, very different place. So I think we have a, a new opportunity to take time in nature and ask some really different questions. And yes, we can learn from textbooks. Yes, we can learn from different places. But when you take time in nature, it'll inspire you in a completely different way about what's possible. If you learn to look at that with a different set of glasses, you can start to take the small steps differently. This is what I do with my children. They say, if you love them so much, why do you throw them off cliffs? <laughs> it's because spending time in nature gives them a quality of what we can do. And the urgency is now, 
And I think that's where we need to start. So spend more time in nature, get out there, and ask some really different questions. Thank you very much.